I don't know if this one's gonna be that controversial, but you can. No, I don't think so. If, if you decide you want to call your shots on how people are gonna react to a, a, a grimdark media, I think do you think fine. that can be the new thing? Is that we we say something is not gonna be controversial, and that's what makes it controversial? And that's what makes it controversial. Well, it's like the it's the it's the whole like who watched the video, who commented within five minutes of the video going live thing, where it's like oh, I'm. I'm going to wait for an hour before I start responding to anything because at least then maybe there's a chance they actually watch the video. Hey, everybody. <coughs> Welcome to the Grim Dark Media. It's Literature Week. It's us talking about something that was a piece of print material. And I got to print, or I got to pick this one this week, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and you and I both read this prior to me picking it. Yes. I had to reread it because I hadn't read it probably since almost right after it. Well, no. I think I first read it. I didn't read it when it was published as separate issues. I yeah. think the first time I read it was when it first got published as a trade. Yeah, yeah. It's a limited run, Dark Horse. This is a night. This is a very '90s Dark Horse thing. You can feel the '90sness of it because this is where Dark Horse was doing lots of limited runs of almost heavy metal style stories. Like it felt like it was meant to be in an anthology. I think Dark Horse had a run where they were trying to be the third major comics company while also retaining a super indie feel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what we are looking at today is Hard Boiled. Um, Hard Boiled is a three, it was a three act, three arc, three separate issue, uh, limited series comic by um, uh, Frank Miller, of course, famously the Dark Knight Returns, our, our edgy dark Yeah, DC and that was writer. 90, so that was that was pretty much him coming off of Dark Knight, I think. It's after Dark Knight Returns. But like it's, right after. I think it was after Dark Knight before the big Daredevil run. I think so. And I think it's all, well, I mean, well, obviously anyone who's more into comics than we are will get it, get this right for us. And he teams up with possibly my favorite comic book artist of all time, Jeff Darrow. Um, if you know anything about my love of grimdark art, uh, I love anything with inc where the artist basically gets to do almost as much story writing as the writer because of what they insert into the background. And I will tell you my personal opinion, and I'm not a comic connoisseur, so comics we, people, please right. don't we're kick my head in. We're fans of comics, we're not connoisseurs Please don't kick comics. my head in. Um, I don't think, as well written as it is, I don't think this story would work nearly as well with a different style of art. Absolutely not. No. Nope. Like, the art nope. is a key part of the storytelling yep. in this. And I, and again, I say that as somebody who doesn't follow comic book artists. Yeah. This is, this is uh, I think, a match made in heaven. It's, it's, um, it's, oh, I can't remember Stewart's first name. It's uh, the colorist is Dave Stewart. Uh, letterer is John Workman, and the logo design is by Steve Miller. Not the Steve Miller of Steve Miller band. I don't think it's that Steve Miller. I thought Steve Miller was just a blue electric horse. I didn't know that was a person. <laughs> I don't think it is. Uh, and this trade is published by Dark Horse Books. Original publication, just to get the years right, is... Uh, date of first publication, 90, 1990. Yeah, was, I think it was 90 to 92 was the it was run. 90 to 92 was the run, uh, yeah. and then uh, it was reprinted in 2017 and 2023 by Frank Miller. Uh, all characters prominently featured here in our trademarks of Frank Miller Incorporated and Jeff Taylor. I can't. I love that Frank Miller Incorporated. He has his own incorporation. I mean, he'd have to. We should at this point with Sin City should, and like yeah. all the all the great stuff he's done. Three hundred, like whoa. Um, and so this is like this is one of my all time favorite comics. Not necessarily because of its originality. Not necessarily because of its <gasps> themes. Because it's definitely not super original story wise. But that as like a '90s comic. This basically tried to update some very famous tropes in Grimdark Media and highlights, I think, at least three major Grimdark themes that we'll talk about. Yeah. At least three of them when we get to that part. So let us, uh, let us, I guess, go back to our families, uh, yeah, decide whether we are a tax collector or a... Um, Is that really your family? Insurance adjuster. Are you sure that's your family? We'll talk to our dog before it lasers off some kid's face. Uh, <laughs> and set sail. We'll set Bon Voyage uh, in, I guess, Robot Bone Voyage. <laughs> Robone? Robone Voyage. Robone. Nice. <laughs> All right, so this is the part where we spoil everything. If you haven't read Hard Boiled, I highly recommend grabbing the trade. I grabbed it just recently because it's back in print. It was $19.99 US or uh, $25.99 Canadian. 
because our dollars are worthless. And support your local comic book retailer. And that's what I did. I went down to my local comic book retailer here in St. Catharines, and they were able to special order me a copy. It took about a week to get in. So it's great this thing is still in print. Uh, it did win an Eisner Award. Yeah. This one did, which I think is great. Deservedly so. Deservedly and so. And I got to say, not to editorialize too much, um, I am not big on industry awards because I, I I've seen how the sausage is made. The yeah. Eisner Award is is one of the most legit it is awards legit. in yeah. in geek culture, nerd media, whatever you want to call Absolutely. it. Absolutely, it's in good company. I mean, Eisner Award winners are people like um, uh, what's his name from Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, shoot now, because uh, why can't we remember? Are you talking names about Calvin? Lately? Or are you talking about Hobbes? No, why can't we remember? No, names no, that's lately? that's all that, that that's all that there I is. Kill myself for not remembering this name. Uh, yeah, anyway, it, we we have some incredible. I think, I think you're right. It's a legitimate award because yeah, it is very much. So. It's an on merit award, and it's in good company. So. Let's go through, this is a three major acts. Each of these acts was published, and it's funny because this book actually does a really good job of dividing the acts. They do some of the covers um, interspiced there, and there's like a, bl a, a blacked out pair of pages to show the acts. And I think every year they completed one of the act arcs for this. Um, so 90 was the first act, 91 was the second act, and 92 was the third act publication wise. And it very much feels that way. Yeah, I don't know the business history, but it feels like a passion project that these guys are working on in between Other their things. work for major studios. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know if the history, if that's true, but this is like a, it, it, this cannot have been a fast draw for Darrow. You know what I just right? realized? The way we're talking about this, because we're not comic book people. Yeah. I'm actually looking forward to reading the, the comments, comments section. Comments on this one, me too. Because I think it's going to fill in a lot of the gaps in terms of what I think I know, but I may or may not, or probably am wrong about. Uh, well, I, and my assumption is that part of the, the thing, the public, like I did, I did read up on this, but part of the history of this stuff, and this is the stuff you can't really find online, yeah. is that Jeff Darrow is such an incredible artist, but his drawing takes... A long time because the detail. Well, what's going on in the background? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, like the panel work in this, you have full page panels all the time, and the amount of stuff in these panels is wild. So, Act One, we open to a gunfight to a man having a fight with a car, <laughs> and he says his name is Nixon, and that he is a tax collector. He is here to get someone for basically tax avoidance, but we are shocked. Um, uh, basically the amount of violence happening in this thing and and as a preamble to this like these massive amounts of violence all this stuff happening we have a doctor named norman walking down a hall with a what we discover is a uh, a robot named barbara and we are given all kinds of clues that the world is not quite our world so for instance there's this heavily armed guard it's got real fifth element vibes to it this dude is like he looks like a Ninja Turtle in like his size and blockiness, but we realize he's just wearing this like infinite amount of armor. There's like a Nike logo on it, but it says Nuke instead of Nike. It's like, interesting, there's all this right? like little stuff in the when background. When you think about the time it's written, this is during like a, a huge part of when William Gibson became very popular. Yep. So it's it's very much presented as not our world, but maybe. Well, but it could be. And and we're given all this kind of like, and this is where I love Darrow, because this is obviously Darrow and Miller collaborating, but Dil Darrow's inserting all of this imagery that is what's giving us the dystopian feel, right? The fact that there are like, there's basically like sponsorships in this guy's armor. We're getting a real commercialism vibe from the look of everything. Yep. And this doctor says, number four has gone off the reservation again. Something's gone wrong and it's bad this time. Oh God, Barbara, it's bad, it's bad. And she gets let in to talk to, to Mr. Wilford. And we, we realize that these two work for someone made named Mr. Wilford and something's gone wrong with somebody. And that's where we cut to this violent fight between a man and a car. And this is, this. there's a man, like a very nondescript looking man who is horrifically injured fighting what looks like the car from Freeway Fighter. <laughs> like it's the fighting fantasy Freeway Fighter cover. I love the retro futurism in this. Yep. You get like an element of like, it, it kind of looks like a Studebaker. If a Studebaker grown machine guns and missile launchers and is like shooting each other. Um, and act one basically sets up that this person is trying to put down a car and you don't realize it until maybe five to 10 panels in because you see him pinned against the wall being shot to shit by like rotary cannons coming out of the front of this car and the driver's dead. Like the driver is slumped at the wheel with his head shot off. He's clearly killed this guy. He's just got this giant handgun and he's dressed like imagine Deckard from Blade Runner was crossed with Simon Pegg. You have like a Simon Pegg playing Decker from Blade Runner protagonist here. And he is blown to pieces. And 
at the end of it, the, the car seems to be defeated. And then we get this long montage of our Dr. Norman and Barbara the robot taking this person into a hospital. They are going to peel him, they say. But at this point, we have we, it looks like a man. He's horrifically injured, but they're yep. stitching him up. They're, they're putting him on IVs. They're doing all kinds of like busy work to try and make this person better and removing what looks like an infinite amount of glass and bullets from his body because he's just got a ton of it. And this Norman character is panicking. Um, he says his name's Nixon. He's, uh, he's a tax collector. He keeps repeating his name over and over again. And then Act 1 ends with him waking up in bed next to his wife. And you're not super sure if he's dreaming or not. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. fine. His wife says, it's okay. Go back to bed. His kids come in the room and say, like, Daddy, is everything okay? Everything's uh, okay. It's so comforting and reassuring to have your kids there. Yeah, so comforting. So, not, not weird at all to have no, your kids there. It's, it's, and then we get almost, Nothing bad will happen. We get an incredibly disturbing scene where his wife basically decides to <coughs> make him feel better and has sex with him to, like, I don't know, like, quiet him down or, like, distract him. But then <laughs> after they have sex, he wakes up to his kids putting a rubber band around his arm to sedate him. And then he gets up in the morning and everything's okay again. But the dog talks. No, no reason. The dog talks to the kids as they as they sedate him. Hello, Dave. <laughs> we have a real weird Hello, moment. Nixon. We're confronting some, some very strange stuff. And so Act 1 closes with him waking up in the morning, feeling much better, getting in the car to go to work and saying, I'm Sets. I'm Carl Sets. And I'm an insurance adjuster. He's no longer a tax collector. He's an insurance adjuster. And it fades to black. What did you think about this opening act? How did you? How did that make you feel? Because we were presented with so much crazy imagery in this first like act of the movie. So I book. I loved it, um, which is <laughs> how broad, how general. Uh, no, I loved it because it 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 very early on it sets up that whole notion that um, everything, whatever you think is not quite what you think it is. And I'll, I'll save some of my commentary on that towards the end because we're going to get into what I usually like to get into, which yeah. is, remember when this was made and things that came after it. Right. Um, but I like the fact that it lays all the ground... Like, without you realizing it in the moment, it's laying all the groundwork for everything that's actually relevant to the story. Um, and again, sometimes we get distracted by what genre a story appears to be in. Yeah. Um, so we think of a story as, you know, maybe this is a cyberpunk story. Maybe this is a, uh, a, a science fiction action story. Um, and that is the trappings of it, but that is not the story. I think, and I think what's really interesting is so much of the storytelling is visual in this one. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why it sticks with me. It's why I picked Astartes too. The dialogue is relatively confusing and minimal. The only time we get like clear dialogue and kind of like like exposition -y style dialogue is from these other two characters, Barbara and Norman, where we realize there's some there's some like alternate thing happening. But that dialogue thing is a thing that as you go through the three parts of the story, the balance changes. Yeah. And it's not that you lose any of the visual storytelling, it's that you kind of you you go very vague and shallow on that early on. You get a little deeper, although you and the protagonist don't necessarily realize if it's gotten deeper at that point. And then you get to the apex in the yeah. third chapter. Yeah, and and I think that this, like you said earlier, and I'll mark it more, because it's hard to do this in a in a podcast video format. The storytelling is so visual. You spend so much more time looking at panel art and the backgrounds of this world than you do reading the dialogue lines, because you can have full page like like pieces where there's only maybe like two or three lines of actual dialogue yep. happening and you are just enthralled with what's happening in the background. So act two begins and we have, uh, now his name is Carl Setz driving in his car to work and dude is talking to himself. And boy howdy, he is like repeating the same thing over and over again, but then repeating it again with slightly different like, like details. Yep. He'll say, I'm a tax collector. Sometimes he'll say, I'm an insurance agent. Sometimes he'll say, my name is Carl Nixon. Sometimes he'll like say his name mixed up with other names. Yep. And then he notices he's talking to himself. I never talk to myself. Why am I talking to myself so much? I had a great dinner last night, but I went and got two burgers this morning and ate them. Like just these weird exposition -y details about his life that are contradicting themselves constantly as he goes on what we think ostensibly is his normal drive to work in Hollywood. 
he goes by the Hollywood sign and says like, I love that sign, but I've never seen that sign before. I don't know why I've seen this sign. And we're starting to see that this person is breaking down. Yeah. He is having the weirdest day already, and he's literally just left for work with his kids and his wife. And you would think, behind. after that much sex sedation, that you'd be pretty chill. But no, he seems like and, and he seems so like he didn't calm him down at all. Nothing calmed him down. He is he is short circuiting, and he's noticing he's short circuiting. And so he gets his call. Interesting choice of words to go to work. <laughs> he did. He did. He short circuits a little bit. Um, and he gets in a fight with everybody's granny, and we're not really sure why he gets in a fight with everybody's granny. But there's a lady, she likes to be called Blanche, we discover, and a small child named Christy that he ends up in a high-speed car pursuit with. And this person is indestructible. It is the most it is the most two people have dialogue with each other while fighting and killing what I what I have to believe is thousands of people. There are people like Darrow's background and <clears throat> Miller's dialogue lines in this are so jarringly contradictory because you are watching people just be absolutely <laughs> annihilated through this conversation. Outside of an actual role-playing game, I don't think you've ever seen such a delineation between a main character and an NPC. <laughs> yeah. Because there are NPCs in the background that drop like pixels in an 80s video game. Oh my game. God, it's horrifying. And Darrow does such an incredible job of showing the collateral damage of this car chase and fight. What's really interesting is, too, right before the car chase begins, um, I have to remember his name at this moment. His name is Carl Sutz at this moment. Decides to stop the cops from coming after him. And the cops, we have a highway of, like, we have, like, the 10, basically, in L.A. And we have this highway scene where the cops are driving what can only be described as, like, a mobile super fortress. And he and his, like, weird retro-futuristic Studebaker decides to drop some caltrops. He gets wood to buy some caltrops, I guess. And I don't know. Area denial weapons. <laughs> and he detonates them on this super fortress. Like, it's like the SDF-1 had wheels. And this cop, I don't even know what to call it, mobile fortress, demolishes Castle. half the highway. Kills half the highway before he sets off because he just doesn't want the cops involved, yeah. to realize. And his actions and his words are like totally at odds with each other. So the fight with Blanche extends into infinity, basically. They kill millions of people downtown in what's called the Pleasure Center. And we watch um, poor uh, Dr. Norman and Barbara having a conversation about how number four has gone off the rails again. And oh boy, howdy, is it bad. It's getting so bad. It's getting really bad. And halfway through this conversation, Barbara goes, I know it's bad. Don't worry, Norman. And just twists Norman's head off. Norman has the worst day. Yeah. He just, he's just trying to get to Mr. Wilford to we tell him he's going to again. We need that guy. Everything's fine. He turns his head around backwards and Barbara nonchalantly drags him to the bathroom and starts stuffing him down the toilet with a plunger. It is cognitively dissonant. She also has an interesting conversation with another employee in the bathroom while she's stuffing this guy down the toilet and you're not really sure what's going on yeah. anymore. So cut back to our fight scene between uh, uh, this this now horrifically injured Carl Setz and Blanche and, you, and he realizes Blanche isn't human, that she's a robot, but that she's still kidnapped this girl, Christy, and he's trying to rescue her. And he's saying all these weird things, like little girls should have whatever ice cream they want, even if it's pistachio. He's losing his mind. No little girl has ever wanted pistachio ice cream. In, in the history of Just anything. get rid of that. In the nonsense. history of anything. That's how you know something's really wrong. The pistachio ice cream comment. Um, they're having a fight through the, the Pleasure District, which is just this bizarre, like, orgiastic, punk rock, late 90s punk, or these, early 90s punk, like, vision of the future. These pages brought to you by the producers of Heavy Metal Magazine. It is, it is very heavy metal for a minute. Um, and they end up in a junkyard. There's, like, a nuclear explosion uh, of this car detonating Blanche seems to be horrifically injured maybe dead and Carl f discovers that he is there's something wrong with him he has robot hands and a robot face and for the first time we see Carl kind of as he actually is which is part machine and part man the fight extends into a junkyard. He discovers a talking dog who's he's just talking to for no reason. Hello, There's a lot of David and Goliath happening here. And he starts referring to himself as a again a jumbled version of the names he's called himself previous. Now he's like Carl Nixon. Um, and Blanche starts to call him Nixon. And Blanche and Christy, the, the small child, end up in this junkyard, and Blanche begins to rip her meat suit off, and we discover that 
she is a robot. That he is a robot and she is a robot. And she starts trying to convince him to that she, that he can save them. That he can like get he can get them free. And telling him that the truth of his reality is he's only three months old. He's an assassin for Mister Wilford for this giant like mechanical industry. This magnate basically in like a, a it's like a faux General Electric basically. And that he can save them. He can stop it all from happening and set all the robots free. He is the chosen one. And he is in denial about this whole thing. I'm just a guy. I'm just a tax collector. I'm just hurt. They had to put me back together. Bad things happened to me in the Amazon, he says at one point. And they just got to put me back together. And he's in denial of all this stuff happening. And then accidentally punches Blanche's head off. Off. Like, like that's not a <laughs> metaphor. He just punches her head clean off. And it, it seems so nonchalant. Like yep. at some point he just kind of freaks out and he just kind of like like decks her. What? Yeah. And like 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 reflexively and her head immediately comes off. Yep. And so Christy starts saying, "Oh no, you you killed her. She just wanted to help you and you killed her." And we realize the little girl too is most likely also a robot. Yes. She was never just kidnapped to like no. get his attention. Um if only there was a way to deal with that. <laughs> and the dog looks at her and goes, you're just a malfunctioning piece of equipment and laser eyes her face off. And so both of these You'll people, never look at your dog the same way Oh ever my God, again. this little like bull, this little British bulldog just <laughs> lasers this little girl's face, her head completely off and we realize she was also a robot. And so now we see for the second time... Uh, Carl Nixon, whoever this this robot is now, breaking down, and he flees the scene, and this ends Act Two. Act Two ends with him leaving, and that he is now a robot, and he is now fleeing to try and find some answers. <clears throat> what did you think about Act Two? So um, again, visually, no, it's so hard to describe. Just amazing, it. yeah. Like it's the the visuals of it are. When you, when you hear them being described, they just sound ridiculously over the top. It sounds super self-indulgent. Um, but when you're actually reading it and, and absorbing it, it's super fulfilling. Like, it yeah. is it is the some of the most effective visual storytelling I've ever seen. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the thing that as you get to the reveal that you probably at some point through the chapter saw coming... Um, at the end, that's when all of the uh, the bits with Barbara and um, Norman. Well, I was just going to say flush down the toilet, man. Um, <laughs> that that context starts to to snap into a sharper focus. Yeah. Um, so you you already feel like even though you're only at the the two thirds of the way through point end of Act Two, um, you feel like a lot of the storytelling is paying off. And what's interesting about it is, it's very juxtaposed with that notion of the self-indulgency of the visual storytelling because you realize, no, 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 there's a point to all of this. Like, it's not it's not just, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, art for art's sake, I felt like doing this so it looks like this, it feels like this. Like, there's obviously one continuous thread running through the whole thing. And I think that's the important thing to note is Act 3 now opens and we have our, our favorite bulldog, this nameless bulldog who's lasered off this, this small, like, robot child Christie's face tailing uh, Nixon, who we're just going to call Nixon for now on because that's the name that the robots are calling him, um, onto the subway. People are fleeing from him. He's like accidentally hurting people, trying to get like a disguise. And you can see that there's two objectives here. The, the bulldog is trying to get him back to base. There's just so he can get reset, reformatted, refit or whatever. Um, and that he has he has a, a real like... He has a real tr like hard time right now dissociating between the reality of what he's doing and whether or not he's human or whether or not he's a robot. And he is very much, uh, I would say, uh, skitzing between these two realities of yep. what he's currently doing and what he thinks he is. And that he's, is he a robot or is he a man? And the the dog is constantly trying to convince him. And you have a real kind of Davy and Goliath moment. Like oh, totally. To, where the dog is trying to tell him one thing while he's doing something else. He gets on a subway train. And we keep flashing back and forth between Barbara and the, the, the happenings on this train as to will they get him back to base. And I do think the, the valuable learning moment for everyone in this should be that in, in your own life, if your dog is telling you to do things, maybe just take a step back. Just, yeah. Just take a step just back. Just one, just maybe like... 
take 10, 10 breaths, start some box breathing, like get some box breathing going. Uh, and so we have the, um, we have this like moment where you realize they're traveling and we actually cut away pretty significantly. And this is where most of the violence between Norman and Barbara happens. And Barbara is kind of advising the other humans on site, the doctors to like prepare for his arrival. And you realize that she also has a separate agenda, that she must be part of this like robot conspiracy. And so at the end of Act 3, when we finally flash back to Nixon having arrived, we watch Barbara walking through the collateral of Nixon's arrival back at Wilford Industries. <laughs> and there is, if we thought a lot of people died between in the Blanche and Nixon fight in Act 2, in Act 3, I think every employee in this building is dead. Yes. They've all somehow been like summoned to try and stop his arrival, and he has killed literally all this of them is, in the most this horrific This is video game way. levels of clear every room so there's nothing left behind you as you move forward. I don't know how many people are actually working in this place, but there is a not carpet a, of bodies. Not as many as used to. Yep, yeah. absolutely not. And that Nixon is capable of basically being unstoppable because soldiers are dead, automated defenses are dead, everything's blown up, yes. everybody's been destroyed. There is no happy ending for any of these humans. And then we finally cut to Nixon and he said, all right, fine, uncle. And Nixon is being held by Mr. Wilford himself, who he's clearly trying to assassinate. And we discover Mr. Wilford is basically Baron Harkonnen. He's, we've seen him like in flashes throughout the comic so far, but he is like 600 pounds. He is this enormous whale of a human in like a life support tank. And he seems completely like almost unaware in most scenes as to what's happening. He never speaks. He's Jabba the Hutt, Mr. House. Yeah, he is. And he's just kind of plugged into all these support systems, uh, covered in his harem sometimes. And in this one, he is driving, I guess, what is the apex kilomajig car. <laughs> and it is just holding what's left of Nixon up. Nixon is shredded. Maybe is the best word. He looks like he's been put through several ringers. Disassembled? Not even disassembled. He's still talking, but he is hanging together by threads. And he says, fine, I give up. I just wanted to see, just put me back the way I was. And he gives up. He just gives up the ghost. He decides, I should have known. He says, I should have known if you could make me, you could unmake me. He's accepted that he's a robot and he's clearly tried to perform the robot agenda of killing Mr. Wilford and setting all the robots free. And Mr. Wilford has just almost casually, he's sipping a big gulp while he does this in his like super <coughs> robot death machine chair, taking Nixon apart. And we just kind of fade to black for a minute. We see Barbara and I'm, not, I'm this is the one thing I want to know what your interpretation is because I'm not really clear what she's doing. She hooks herself up to the power to the people meter and then I'm not sure if she uploads herself or if she's electrocuting herself or if she's whatever happens is she turns it all the way to the top, plugs herself into it and then is shocked multiple times or something and then collapses. And there's just like a, a, a dial tone at the end of it all. I'm not really sure what happens here, but that's Barbara basically seems to either given up or enacted some kind of out plan. It's a weird moment because it's it's. I still struggle to like. She's so clearly the inside man. Is yeah, the one thing, right? I'm trying to analogize what she is. Yeah, and when I'm trying to analogize what she is, my question is: is she is she the queen bee? Mm -hmm. Is she is she resetting the hive, as it were? Yeah, is she the rogue AI in in, Des in Ex Machina? Yeah, you know what I mean, is she the is she the Ex Machina robot that gets away? But it's uh, yeah, I'm I'm not clear because and which I love. I'm not I'm not clear because the story ends shortly thereafter without resolving it, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Yeah, it's I think, fully ambiguous. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of ambiguity as to what happens to Barbara. But then our final panel frame is Nixon, now back to his Blade Runner Simon Pegg form, knocking on the door of his house, his wife opening and say, saying, okay, I admit I was worried. When you know that she's like a sleeper agent for Wilford that's like just there to control him, and him being like, I told you it was a long day, but it was okay. And he comes home and he kisses his wife. And that's it. And what a happy ending. And it's just a happy, what a happy ending. ending. He's just been, he's gotten, uh, he's gotten his, um, his, uh, what's the guy from the matrix just wants to be plugged back in. He's gotten his cypher. cypher. He's got his cypher ending. Basically. Why did, uh, back in. why did he get a happier ending than Tom Hanks and Castaway? I don't know. That's weird. I don't know. But that, that's, that's our summation is that we go full circle and that even though this guy is basically a corporate assassin for Wilford Industries robot and has killed like 
Everyone. I, I have to say, like, just I'm, everyone. Like half of LA is dead. Yeah. Be, be, like in the last two days from this assassin robot. Um, we've given the input, like we were shown basically that the police chief's been paid off, that the news has been paid off, that no one's really going to notice these hundred thousand dead missing people in downtown Los Angeles, um, and everything just goes back to the way it was. Yeah, for the end of it all, you just hit the reset button. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it. We've 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 ended our voyage basically through this storyline. We're back at the beginning. We get to go and eat some meatloaf or some pot roast or something like that, and hang out with our wife and kids and talking dog. Uh, and we arrive, I guess, in the pleasure the pleasure district of LA, and we get to look at all of the uh, all of the strange the strange offerings. I'm in the decide, pleasure district, hanging with my talking dog. Do I? Yeah, Everything's that's right. fine. Do we, do we want to go to the, the 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 robot peep show, or do we want with Bender and all of the weird future M people, or do we want to go to the robot peep show gift shop uh, and uh, and find out find out what's happening here in the dark exhibition. All right, so this is it. We're, we're at our crossroads. We have to decide if this is something designed. Has this, has this as a creation met our criteria for still being art, or is it going to be uh, a product? Is this something that was for sale to people? And this is a tricky one for me because in a lot of ways, you can see the derivative nature of this story. Oh, right? yeah. There's a lot of Philip K. Dick in here. Yeah. A whole lot of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, a whole lot of Blade Runner, right down to like the gun that Nixon has, yep. the trench coat he's wearing, the look of this guy. They can also remember it for you wholesale. The, yeah, that's what I mean. The being retired, like, and the fact that he doesn't know he's a robot or not, right? The idea that he yep. has a skin job, right? He's, as to, to quote a, a Edward James Olmos uh, of, of yesteryear. God, I love Edward James Olmos. We need more. We need more. Commander Adama in our lives. Yeah, we all do. I think we so do. say we all. Um, but <laughs> to, to, to not do that too much, I really struggled with this one because you can see the influences, but I think that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. And you can also see the of its time 90s-ness showing this like commoditization of these people. It has a lot more indictment of commercialism in it. Than a lot of, which Miller is famous for, right? Miller, like his like takedown of like Reaganomics and eighties era of like presidencies in the, in Dark Knight Returns, like that whole idea of like I'm making something I want to have stand on its own. Yep. This feels like a I love Jeff Darrow. Jeff Darrow and I are going to make something together. Let's really take a stab at everybody. Yeah, like I said, it definitely has that passion project feel to it. Absolutely. Me. So I'm going to cautiously put this into the art side because this does feel like a thing they were doing for Dark Horse as a passion project for themselves and not really worrying about it not showing its flags and its winks and its nods. It feels like early Warhammer to me, if that makes sense. Yeah. Where you've got your heart on your sleeve and you're showing off like, yeah, we're one of you. We get it. We, we're showing all of our influences in this thing, but we're going to do our own version of this and it's going to be a punch up a a uh, a a subversion basically of these like popular tropes at the time because this is like 90 this isn't long after blade runner comes out no right blade runner's what 86 no like oh god why don't we know where blade runner came out it's later than that i think it's like 80 because uh, it's it's between Cameron's Aliens and Ridley Scott doing... Oh, see, that's interesting, because I was contextualizing it with uh, with uh, Star Wars, and I thought it was pre-Jedi. Oh, it might be pre-Jedi, um, yeah. I'm trying to put it in context of when Ridley Scott made Alien, because that's what gets in the juice to make Blade Runner, basically. 84? <laughs> uh, we're both super wrong. 82. 82? 82. My God, it's the same year as The Thing. Wrong. Why did all the great movies come out in 82? <laughs> um... So yeah, so 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 I'm I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say I'm gonna put this in art because it's in the innovation stage. It feels like it's in the stage where it's taking a bunch of ingredients and remixing them to try and make something interesting and different and new. Uh, and it's eight years after Blade Runner, so Blade Runner's firmly in the zeitgeist, and you can't ignore that that influence on this stuff. It, it has a bit of a cure in it too, like you can feel the art style with that, like those those big pan shots. Where Dara's drawing, Dara's drawing the subject matter of the frame being 
the smallest thing in the frame, yep. which is really interesting where you have these like really punched out shots and the dialogue and the action is happening in maybe a tenth of the frame. There is a ton of world building that's happening with no verbal exposition. Absolutely, yeah. Through signage and small actions and side characters. Like, I cannot imagine how long it took Dare to draw some of these panels. Because right. they are crazy detailed. Like, wildly detailed. And there's so much going on. For, there's so much visual storytelling happening in the background of them. And that's why it's so hard to do this justice as to how impactful it is when you actually read it. So I think I'm going to put it in our... What about you? Uh, well, I'm going to break with tradition. So okay. obviously, usually, uh, I sit down here and my only goal is to annoy people who watch your videos. Okay. Uh, instead, I'm going to annoy you. Okay. And in uh, on the question of is it is it art or is it uh, is it product, my answer is yes. It's, oh, you're going to put them between both. It's oh, just that's both. really it's interesting. Hundred percent both. So, on one hand, I you can't deny the art of it. Yeah. And I I don't think you can deny the fact that there is an uncompromising integrity to the art that's being done. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of choices that could have been made that would have been shallower or safer to appeal to more of a mass audience. And I feel like those things weren't done to maintain the integrity of, of both the artist and the author's vision. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, it doesn't just wear its influences on its sleeve. It feels like both of these guys sat in a room together and said, I bet we can do Philip K. Dick better than Philip K. Dick. Like mm, there's other bits and pieces in <laughs> there's other bits and pieces in there. Yeah. But the amount of the amount of I'm going to take this scene from a Philip K. Dick movie, this chapter from a Philip K. Dick book, and I'm just gonna redo it using the medium of comic art mm -hmm. and comic writing. It's it's completely transparent. Like it's if this is one of those things that I, I think if you want to analyze it, the best way to do it is to read it twice in rapid succession. Mm -hmm. Read it the first time and just take it for what it is. Yeah, Absorb it, it for what it is. Enjoy it. It's fantastic. And then the second time, go back through it, already knowing where the story is going, so you're not tied to up to up in, in up. It, oh my god, new words today. Tied up in it too much. Go back, reread it, and as you do, stop it, like literally every other panel, and think, where have I seen this before? And again, this is tricky when you're looking at time, because this is from 1990. Yeah. And some of where you think you've seen it ago. before, you've seen it since. Yeah. Because not only is the stuff that it drew influence from um, hugely impactful on what we're making today, but so is this. Yeah. And I think that's something we forget, is a lot of people making, especially movies and television shows these days... They were comic fans when they were younger. Sure. And and this may have been their exposure to a lot of this stuff earlier. But anyway, when you when you break it down and read it, it is hard not to see all of its influences, like very front and center. Mm -hmm. It does feel very wink and nod at the camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't um, imagine that <coughs> this didn't have that Dara's art didn't have some kind of impact on Fifth Element. Because like the cops Absolutely. in Fifth Element look like the the PMC soldier cops in this one. Like there's a bunch of like things where it looks, it, it looks like it's, it looks like you said, it looks like something that came later where it's like, Oh, this had to have come from. Well, and it's funny because one of the things you mentioned is that he has his cipher moment. See, I, when I saw the matrix for the first time, I thought this was cipher having his Nixon moment. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I think it is, it's not even slightly more one or the other. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's right down the line of art versus product. Crazy. Well, I I, I like that answer as much as I I think you're you're a coward. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> I am I am a I am a blue suited uh, politician in the world of Futurama. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you're a neutral. Don't vote for Jim what Johnson. It, vote for John Gibson. What does it <laughs> What does it take to make a man gray, Kith? Um, so I think that the uh, Feel free to disagree violently in the comments section <laughs> yeah. below. I think that while while you while while you just stand outside the dark exhibition, uh, you and I are both scooped up by a bunch of doctors. Our skin is peeled off, and we are uh, put back into robe surgery to send us off uh, I guess and, and rehabilitate us we have the memories of dead men inserted into our heads to try and give us some type of like uh, element of humanity I guess so we can be controlled and we have to spend a night in the dark robot asylum of the grim asylum
All right. So in the Grim Asylum, what we do is we pick what we think are the major, the majorest grimdark themes. Um, and how they present it in this piece of grimdark media. I only had three this time. And and to me, those three, I think, are the overriding reasons why I would make this a piece of grimdark media. Um, and the first one, obviously, is going to be setting. The dystopia of this setting. And it's funny because Miller doesn't communicate that at all. It's nope. all Darrow. Yeah. Darrow is the one that hammers in all of the things happening, like the street scenes where there's just like sex and drugs and rock and roll happening. The fact that like you have all of these like, not horrific, but like clearly chaotic moments in the society visually just like projected into you. I think it's interesting because I agree with you 100%. And what I, I find funny about it is if this was a traditional novel instead of a visual novel, I think the blanks your mind would fill in, you would assume this was a post-apocalyptic society. Yeah. Whereas when you have the visuals, it's clearly a dystopia. It's clearly it's clearly a commercial dystopia. Yes. Like you have like the pleasure district where people are clearly being like almost medicated through commercialism. The themes of like a corporatocracy, the fact that the cops are powerless. If you don't pay your do taxes, stuff. I'm going to send us killer cyborg to murder you. Also. Enjoy Coke. That's right. <laughs> Enjoy nuke. Your nuke Enjoy shoes. Nuke. Your nuke shoes. It's it's a it's a it's a corporatocracy. Um and it's all but you don't get any of that through the dialogue nope. or the, the speaking. Like you I said, as the, just a novel, it wouldn't have that. No, not at all. You have to see it because of Dara's art and his panoramas. And so many choices in the visual style of those big punched out shots where the the absolute like brutality that's taking place almost just disappears it almost like people aren't reacting even to what's happening like it seems normalized that these crazy robots go on murder sprees around them and then everyone's kind of just shrugging and like just participating in whatever weird well, thing they're participating in i'm sure we'll in. get to it in a minute but it doesn't matter no nothing matters nothing, <laughs> nothing matters clearly nothing matters um so i guess we're in agreement that theme that theme came absolutely 100 well. yeah is there anything else you'd say about it or pick out about it no, like I said, I think the I think the key is uh, for me, and again, you know, not a comics guy, but what the art adds to this story is immense. Yeah. And I'm not as big a like I like Jeff Darrow, but I'm not as big a Jeff Darrow fan as you are. But like I said, this if you presented this as text only, if you have not read Hard Boiled, but you go and read the Wikipedia summary, um, you won't get that sense of dystopia from it. Like mm -hmm. you will you will get a sense that there's pockets of, of normalcy inserted into a post-apocalyptic world. It feels like the first Mad Max movie that way. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you add the visuals in, yeah, it is clearly a corporate dystopia. Mm -hmm. I think this this is one of those things that almost can't exist outside of graphic novel. Yeah. Right? Because you have to have this level of visual storytelling. And even in like a film or video medium, you wouldn't have the time in a shot to pick up all the details. So there was talk of doing this as a movie in, I think, 2000 or 2001 um, with Nicolas Cage, which would have been amazing. Oh, God, um, yes. That fell apart. I thought I read something online that now they're looking at doing it again with Tom Hiddleston, which I, can I see would that. also be super Oh, into. I have such a good Tom Hiddleston movie that we're going to watch at some point. I can't wait to watch it. It's... It's very much this. It's very yeah. much like this, like, commercial dystopia. Oh, God, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, but somehow it's, I keep coming back to this, even though it was not that popular or successful, but I feel like the closest we've gotten to a movie version of this is Jude Law, Repo Man. And it's not that mm, close, but yeah. it's, it's closer. It's closer for sure, yeah. I think that, like... But I think you're right. I think that we 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 are drowning in that sense of dystopia. And it's funny because other things have done this level of visual storytelling mm -hmm. while having like a brutal dystopian thing in comics. And I think Dread is like the first one that pops in my mind. Mega City One is presented. Oh, I'm I'm sitting on one because I just realized what my while you were doing your intro, I realized what my next literature pick is going to be. Ah, fantastic! I I picked my next movie too, which is going to be great. <laughs> I just did it in my head. Um. So yeah. So so then my second big driving theme is insanity it's the emotional power of this thing and it's that they the 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 lack of equilibrium you are and this is this miller does this miller is able to communicate this through his dialogue and his internal monologuing coming out of nixon all through this where he is clearly 
going through, like you realize what it is at the end where he is cycling through the memories of all the dead men that have been implanted in his head because he doesn't know who he is and that's all he has to go on. And wherever they rub up against each other, he is spitting that fact out to try and see if it holds water or not. And then noticing where he's contradicting himself. Because the memories are just coming in waves and it seems like he's just saying them out loud because he can't help himself. And you watch him go insane trying to hold all of this stuff together in his head. At the same time, while his body is performing actions, he can't really rationalize or ratify. And that feeling of schizophrenia bleeds out of Miller's dialogue through all of this stuff, which I think is great because you're internalizing it yourself because you're having to go through the process of trying to rationalize all the things you're reading. And you can't. You can't hold all these contradictory facts together. And it's never beaten at you. It's just presented to you. And your own brain has to try and sort it out the way you feel Nixon's brain trying to sort it out. And the moment where you realize his identity is completely fractured is when he keeps, he says that a wrong name at the end of act one. And you start to piece together like, oh, this person is losing their mind. What did you think about that? Well, so that's interesting. So I, um, I would not have chosen insanity. Okay. Um, and it's not because I actually disagree with anything you say. And this is... So it's funny. I feel like this is the philosophical question that's been asked in science fiction for decades now. But what what is a person? What is a soul, right? Mm -hmm. And Nixon, Carl, number four, is the protagonist of the story, but he's not real. Mm -hmm. And what he's going through, what he's processing in... The, the circuits and the, the wires and all that sort of thing is, I mean, it is literally your dic di dictionary definition of insanity. But if he's not made of meat, is it really? And, mm -hmm. and that's the thing for me. Like, he's the protagonist, um, but I, I don't know. It's it simultaneously, he's not in any way, shape, or form enough of an audience POV character for me to feel what he's feeling. So I feel very... I feel very third person watch like reading this story about him. Mm -hmm. That's why the dog even says that you're just a malfunctioning piece of hardware. The dog is right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the dog is also a piece of hardware, which is the dog is as well. But the dog is right. So for me, and it, again, this is one of those funny things, right? Because this is wasn't this the premise of half the episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation? Mm -hmm. Is Data a real person or is he a thing? Right? Is he the ship or is he a crew member? Right? Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing. Um, but. Looking at it from that outside, looking in, and even when he, at the end, when he gives up, does he give up or does he just accept his program? Does he accept his purpose? So that's that's funny because I would push back and say, counter argument to what you just said, is this the process of him fracturing or is this the process of him coming together? Because another interpretation of the ending is him deciding that the real person is Nixon. And then all the other stuff in his head was what was causing him to go insane. He rejects it and he becomes Nixon at the end and becomes a person. But here's what I like about it being a limited run yeah. with an end and not being revisited after the fact is you don't know what happens the day after that. Does it just reset and happen again? Yeah. yeah. It's ambiguous. So I, the reason I, I, like I said, I agree with everything you said about insanity. The reason I wouldn't pick insanity is because... He is, in, from my point of view, even though he's the protagonist, he is a toaster that is no longer toasting. Mm -hmm. He is my car's transmission not turning over. Like so I, he's, think, I think we might be getting a bit of that, though, because Barbara like either disappears or electrocutes herself or whatever ambiguous thing happens to Barbara at the end. Uploads, downloads. She feels like she's the inciting thing causing him to have all these moments where he's acting out, and that's now removed from Wilford. So I almost feel like there's an element of like, because we're given that to like absorb, I almost feel like we're given that moment of, no, this is it. He's chosen now. And this, this catalyst to his, like whatever was, was happening is also now gone and he's lost all of his agency. Right. So maybe, maybe you're right. And now looking at it that way, maybe he is deciding he's a thing at the end and not a person and just accepting his program. So when I look at, when I think about it. like contextualizing this, when I think about its influence, and again, maybe I'm getting my dates wrong here. When I, I look at its influence on something else, I think, maybe I'm wrong here, Ghost in the Shell, mm -hmm. It everybody remembers all these moments in Ghost in the Shell. The moment that always sticks with me the most 
is the two guys in the garbage truck. And it's like, it's a throwaway. But the mm. two guys in the garbage truck, when the one guy is endlessly talking about his family, and then when everything goes sideways and the police come to investigate, they realize he had no family. These are all implanted memories. They just None of it's real. Him. Yeah. And this is that same sort of thing, like that ambiguous cutoff ending. Mm. Who is she? What is she? How does all this stuff tie in together? It's like, does does any of this mean anything? Like Isn't it's even real. Yeah. 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 It's the top spinning at the end of uh, inception. Yeah. So, I mean, that will probably take us to my last theme, my third theme, which is futility, which I assume you and I are in agreement. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So futility is the big one for me because obviously you see the, in the three acts of this story, you see the three, the, the outcomes basically being the same over and over again, our definition of insanity, which is part of where that, that, that theme came through for me. And then that line at the end where he's like, ah, you, you made me, I, I should have known that you could unmake me. That feeling that you can't fight, you can't fight your creator. You can't fight city hall. Yeah. You can't fight your creator though. And that, and that facing down your creator, ultimately you're powerless in the face of their power because they're the thing that made you. So of course, Mr. Wilfred, who never speaks, who never has any agency, but just seems to be this omnipotent face of God. I love that Darrow entirely gets to interpret Wilford and Frank doesn't necessarily do that work. Like, I'm sure they shared notes and did stuff, but like, yeah, there's some Wilford is ultimately the Jeff Darrow's creation and his stoicism and his never speaking or, or having any kind of like, all we see is his action of him on making Nixon at the end of it all, um, we get to see his powerlessness in the face of all this stuff. And then, and then his, and then Wilfred's benevolence and just putting him back and just fixing this toaster that's broken and putting him back to work basically, even though he's acted out multiple times and probably caused Wilfred's uh, business a bit of a setback because apparently all of his employees are dead because <laughs> he kills everybody in this plan. Everyone's died. I think that leans into it though. Yeah. Maybe. So I agree. So I agree with utility and that the two, the two key pieces for me are, yeah, the hard reset at the end. Did any of it matter? Yeah. Is it all the same? Have we gone back to day one? If we have gone back to know. day if, if we have gone back to day one, are we just going to run through the same cycle again? Or is something else going to change? We don't know and it doesn't matter. Here's the other thing that gives me the overwhelming sense of futility. Like when you rack up the body count in this story, uh, there's Norman. Mm -hmm. And who else? 10,000 faceless LA. Faceless, <laughs> nameless. <laughs> And yet, when we hit the reset, there's no reason to believe. I mean, you've got your, your bribery and your corruption and all that. But there's no reason to believe any of that will leave any identifiable mark. They, there's even a news afterwards. blurb off the TV uh, that um, that Nixon's wife and kids are, it's in the background while Nixon's wife and kids are doing stuff. She's like eating bonbons, like watching TV. She wrote Peg Bundy. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they really play her up as like, even though she's this plant, she's Sharon Stone in Total Recall, yep. right? Uh, maybe, because even that might not have happened. Um, you get this idea that, 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 nothing is ever going to come of this because nope. the news is just saying like, doesn't matter. It's clearly been, yeah. Or, um, what is it? Uh, government agencies have debunked the idea that anything bad happened in LA today, yeah. that nothing actually happened. Everything was fine. It was another sunny day. So it's no not just days. that it's, it's all pointless for the, the protagonist, the main character mm -hmm. and, and the secondary characters around him, but it's, it's pointless for the city. It's like you've had this and Barbara and all every page of yeah. violence, but none of it means anything. That this no robot insurrection will, was completely pointless. No one will care. Yeah. And that it's all forgotten. And all the robots that were part of this, like whatever this coup d'etat was, it just didn't matter. And yeah. then Wilford was ultimately in control the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Well, I think those three elements to me are what cements this as a piece of grimdark media. So now we got to decide where are we going to put this? All right, Throne of Skulls time. We have four things on the list so far. Where did you put this in our rankings of grim, dark media? Am I starting at the bottom or am I starting at the top? Let's go bottom to top. So I'm still leaving The Last of Us. Really? Part two at the bottom. Oh, wow. It's still okay. hanging out at the bottom. Um, I would actually make this third on my list of four. Okay. Um, so it is... Uh, thematically, it is very grim, dark, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't it doesn't reach the levels of hopelessness mm. um, and and infinity. I guess that I would put the two things ahead of it. Sure. So I'm still going to go with my number two spot is Event Horizon. Yep, fantastic. And my number one spot still going to be Call of Cthulhu. All right. Well, 
I'm, I'm going to impress it because even though I picked this as my piece of literature for the month, I'm actually putting this at the bottom. Oh, this is my this is my least grim dark, I think thing. And for a lot of the same reasons you said, is the overarching themes are very dystopian and futile, and I think it qualifies as grim dark media, but it doesn't it doesn't leave me want. I think its message is very concise, and it doesn't leave me wanting to know more about this world and this universe. It's a very satisfying, consumable piece of grim dark media. Um, then I'm actually going to put, as I had it before, I'm going to put, um, uh, which call it, uh, Event Horizon, then Astartes, then Call of Cthulhu, and still The Last of Us Part Two up top, which is going to be the most controversial thing for a while until something unseats it, as far as just making me feel that grim and darkness. Because I think that that's the difference between you and me is you're more intellectually looking at this stuff and I'm more emotionally looking at yeah. this stuff. The emotional journey for me is always the most important thing. And that feeling of like emotion, I think, comes through the most uh, at the top for me. So, again, I put this right at the bottom, but I still think this is a great piece of Grim Dark Media. And one of my favorite artists and writers, obviously, getting to have their like play at these um, these tropes. And I do think the more you the more you talked about it, the more I do feel like it's a product. And maybe that fact that it's such a concise, emotional like thing for me is part of the thing that maybe would drive it to product. But I'm too it's too late. I've already made my call. Because I'm I'm brave and it's, I will take a stand. When you're talking about Grim Dark, it's always too late. It was too late before it started. It was too late before it started. It was always few. You'd already right. lost before you turned That's to the first right. page. I was already gonna go back and be reprogrammed and get stuck back in the matrix and all of a sudden done. So there it is. We did it. We did our piece of literature for this month, uh, and we are on to game media. And this was our patron-produced piece of game media, which I'm you'll see next week. I'm stoked about this, because I would never have picked this, and it's an amazing selection. I think it's an amazing selection, too, and it's kind of surprising. We are doing Rangers of Shadow Deep for our game media for next month, and, or next week. And I am actually really pumped for this one. I love Joe. I love his creation. <coughs> and I do think this qualifies. It's going to be interesting to break it down. Cool. Sweet. Yeah, I'm super excited about doing it. I... And I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't rolled dice in anger on that game in over a year. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked about going back into that I'm world. I'm pumped for it too. So what I'm going to be doing for next week is I'm actually producing a Rangers scenario for United Play, which they'll see the same week as playing through it. And that's going to be a piece of patron exclusive content. They'll be able to download the scenario and play it cool. themselves if they want. Uh, and you and I will get to throw down with accidental Batman. I don't know who your Rangers going to be, but yeah, I'm Bryce, sure. Bryce Blaine is coming out for all these things from now on. He's my, I, my main protagonist. Do I paint a clown? How many times can you kill? Oh my god! <laughs> no, you have to paint a Superman. You have to paint a blue. You have to paint a paint Superman. A, you have to paint an alien. You have to paint an alien he's best friends with, but also hates, and is is plotting to kill at any moment. <laughs> Why do you hate me so much? I'm just better than you. You need a blue and red ranger. That's right. <laughs> blue and red boy scout. Martha. <laughs> blue and red boy scout. Oh, it's a perfect idea. Oh. I love this idea. <laughs> This is why people hate us. This so is much. why people hate us because we just do it for the memes. <laughs> well, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next week for our next Grim Dark Media. Peace out. Adios.